everyone to In the Spirit of Things, our conversations series during COVID. Um, today I have with me Janine Shepherd, who I met some years ago and I'm delighted she's able to join us all the way from Wyoming in the US. It's uh, what time there, Janine? It is, well, it's 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Well, we're just starting our work day here in Australia. So maybe I can just give everyone a little bit of background. Janine was an Olympian skier. Um, she had a tragic accident whilst training. But the important thing that I think, and she'll share a little bit of her story shortly, is Janine used that profound experience because it was life-changing to actually reshape her life and and one of the things we've been talking through in these in the spirit of things is you are not necessarily finitely determined by something that happens to you you can use that as a stepping stone for other things within your life to give meaning and purpose so Janine maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background it happened a long time ago when you've certainly yeah. moved on but obviously there's still some lingering challenges you have yeah, well, um, you know, I had my accident when I was 24. I, I was an, I'd been an athlete, had been all my life, was training for the 88 Winter Olympics in Calgary, was on a training bike ride with my teammates when I was run over by a speeding truck. And um, I say I had a, a, not a near-death experience, but I had a death experience. I, I left my body. Um, I had a profound, life-changing spiritual experience from that. Spent 10 days in between worlds, um, woke up in the hospital thinking that I wouldn't come back to my broken body, and I did. And that is really where this sort of journey began. I had extensive injuries, you know, broken neck and back in six places. You know, I mean, I lost almost five litres of blood. I had head injuries, internal injuries, massive blood loss, broken bones, um, and spent almost six months in a spinal ward and got out in a wheelchair and being told by doctors that... I'd have to rethink everything I did in my life because I'd never be able to do the things I did before. Do you remember um, how you felt at that time? I don't remember the accident at all because I'd left my body. Um, when I was in hospital, it was a sort of a, you know, spinal wards are not nice places to be, but it was a very profound and rich experience as well. And I learned a lot from that time in the spinal ward. Um, it was my worst nightmare, you know, because... I was an athlete. I was defined by my body. That's how I put myself out in the world. So it challenged everything about my life and who I thought I was. And I don't think the really, you know, the struggle of the journey happened till I got home and um, experienced, you know, the, the dark night of the soul. Um, how long was the re rehabilitation process? Oh, it continues to this day. I mean, I'm actually a walking paraplegic. So um, I live with a disability. I'm, you know, I'm like, a, I'm a paraplegic, but I'm walking. So I had to learn to self catheter. Um, you know, I have no feeling from the waist down. Uh, had to, you know, I learned to walk again. Um, but the most um, extraordinary thing I think about my story that people find fascinating is, you know, that moment of, um, you know, when I got home from hospital and and being very deeply depressed about my body and my life and my dreams. And, um, and I realized that it was so painful. The only way I was ever going to move forward was to let go of my old life. And when I did that, when I really surrendered to the experience, my life changed in the most profound and remarkable way. And for those that have seen my TED talk, they'll know. I mean, I, you know, in a wheelchair looking up and seeing an airplane flying over and thinking, well, that's it. If I can't walk, I'll fly. <laughs> and that moment changed my life. So how long ago was that? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, that happened in, you know, 1986, you know, that I started the journey of flying, which, you know, I have to say when people ask me about flying, you know, why flying? And, you know, and, I, you know, I have to say honestly that I think flying found me. I think, you know, it's a, there's a, very, you know, a great sort of um, spiritual aspect to flying. And it's a great metaphor for life, you know, for freedom. I mean, it was the, mo you know, the furthest thing from being paralyzed in a spinal ward that I could possibly imagine. <laughs> what did your parents say when you said you were going to fly? Oh, my mum was like, oh, that's nice. Another cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they thought it was crazy. And everybody thought it was crazy. I mean, I was in a wheelchair and a plaster body cast, you know. So I was lifted into an airplane for the first time and 
it was the most extraordinary experience. It was the most joyful experience. And at that stage, you know, I didn't think I'd ever pass a medical for a pilot's license, but um, I sort of now had purpose and a reason to get out of bed every day. And, um, you know, sort of fast forward, I went on and became a private pilot and a commercial pilot and a flying instructor and an aerobatics flying instructor. And I ended up in less than a year after I'd left the spinal ward and teaching people how to fly airplanes upside down. My goodness, and the doctors must have been amazed, were they? <laughs> oh, that was stunned. That was stunned. Um, and I still, my actually, my my orthopaedic surgeon, who's now retired, um, had a picture of me in his room up on his mantle um, as an example to all his other patients of what's possible in life. Well, I mean, you can be given a diagnosis and told all sorts of terrible things, mm. but the mind's an extraordinary thing. The sense of will and, and the human spirit is really capable of anything. Yeah, I mean, it is. And, you know, whatever they doctors tell you, and I understand why they do, but, you know, they become self-fulfilling prophecies and nobody really knows um, what's possible. And, you know, the journey for me wasn't really about learning to walk or learning to fly. It was about learning to live again. And it was about tapping into something, you know, different. It was, you know, for me, it was like the, there was a part of me, my ego that said, you know, I'm my body, you know, I that's how I define myself. And then the, you know, the spiritual side said, Hey, let's go fly. So it was a really, you know, interesting journey or, and still is. So we've been a skier, we've been a pilot and now we're a TED speaker of some note and a professional international speaker. How did that happen? Well, you know, when I, um, wrote my first book back in Australia way back then, Never Tell Me Never. Um, you know, people just started, I mean, I wrote that book for myself. You know, I, I never, I, you know, I didn't, I, I remember thinking, I wonder if anyone will ever read this book. And, um, you know, it's just been the most extraordinary journey. And from writing Never Tell Me Never, I was just, you know, inundated with people writing to me and emailing me about their own experiences, which was an enormous part of my healing. And then, of course, people just started asking me to come and share my story. And, I mean, that sort of launched this, you know, the speaking career. And um, I've been doing that for over 20 years now. And it's been, I mean, I love it. I love speaking. I love the opportunity to share my story because I really believe that when I get on the stage and share my story, what I'm actually doing is just holding up a mirror for other people to see their own story, their own journey. You know, I think that we're all living the one story in just in different ways. Did you expect the, the amount of views to happen on the current TED, you know, it's a current TED stories? Well, 1.6 million, isn't it? The last count. Yeah. So it was um, actually put on TED.com as the talk of the day. And, you know, that's been extraordinary. I mean, I, you know, I've had letters from all over the world, emails from all over the world from um, one of the most profound, actually, which was one of the reasons I moved to America was from a, a man in India who wrote to say he had had an ailment for 17 years and he was about to commit suicide. And then he saw my talk and he said, and my life starts now. And I just remember thinking, I have to keep sharing my story. That's my purpose. That's why I'm here. And, you know, that sort of prompted the, the move to a, to the States um, after two more huge seminal, you know, experiences in my life. People know my story from my accident or many people do, but of course, um, what they don't know is, you know, I got married. I had three children. They said I wouldn't have children. My marriage broke down and that was the beginning of 10 years as a single mum, which was an incredibly painful and difficult experience. And then from the GFC, losing my house. And so I've experienced an enormous amount of loss. And I know that, um, you know, from those painful experiences can come the most incredible gifts. It's interesting you should raise that because we've been talking a lot about grief and loss um, and the fact that we tend to think of grief and loss just around bereavement with, with life. We don't necessarily think about the other areas of grief and loss, such as career, um, uh, health, all of those sorts of things. And you obviously experienced many of those compounding together, it sounds like. No, it, it's been, you know, I think in many ways my marriage breakdown was... Um, you know, my husband at the time, I thought, well, you know, I'm happily married. I've had my big accident and it's now happily ever after. And of course he, 
had a breakdown with a mental illness. It was incredibly painful to see someone you love um, go through something like that. And it made the marriage untenable. That was probably in many ways more painful than my accident because it was something completely out of my control. You know, I felt in my accident, I could, you know, get, pull myself up and get my life back. But with this, it was something completely new and, um, you know, out of my you know, sort of realm of, you know, my toolkit. So that was um, incredibly painful. And then of course, from that being a single mum, raising three kids on my own as a woman with a disability, um, I ended up, you know, because of, of that and what I went through with my marriage, I lost my house. And um, again, it was, I always say, you know, with my accident, um, the title, the original title of my TED talk was You're Not Your Body. I realized I wasn't my body. I also realized that I wasn't my marriage. And then I realized I wasn't my house. So, you know, I think that for me, the lesson in all of this is, you know, not def you know, when you define yourself by things outside of you, you're on a very slippery slope because eventually we're going to lose everything. And, you know, or everything in life, we just have to hold it very, very lightly. How extraordinary we're talking to today, just given some of the conversations we've already had. I I've been talking to a number of people and I've called them with great respect, the wounded healers, because people who have been through profound experience and life is not linear you don't have this joyous you know trip along life it's up and down and some of us are dealt much more than others but it's sounding like through your lows you grew so much that you're really happy to share that with other people oh that's i mean that's i feel like that's why i came back to my body i mean that's been i mean it's a quid pro quo i mean you know you give whatever you give out is what you get back and being able to share my journey and and give other people permission to share their story has been an enormous part of my healing it's taken me out of my small story into a much greater human story and that is that we're all you know we're all experiencing and we all will experience loss and pain as well as all the joyful experiences. It's all of, it's all of it. It's... So let's just talk about some of the wonderful opportunities you've since had in terms of speaking. Who's been in your audience? You know, delighted. <laughs> well, I mean, the TED audience was an, you know, incredible experience to, um, to have spoken there at Kansas city. And, and from that have, you know, have come the most amazing experiences. I actually am, you know, married again now. I met my current husband um, around five years ago, but actually a little earlier. He saw my TED talk and wrote to me the most beautiful. Really? Yeah, we met through my TED talk and we were married a couple of years ago in Kenya, actually, by Samburu warriors in a riverbed in northern Kenya. It was extraordinary. Um, and he, you know, I'd always, he's my soulmate. He's my... Um, spiritual partner in life and um, we work together we live together um he's my he's a, he's my teacher um it's you know it's been a blessing and also from my ted talk my uh, latest book that i wrote um, a few years ago to launch to america and the world has been optioned in hollywood and um yeah. Yeah, and we're just about to sign on um, a wonderful A-list uh, screenwriter for that. So um, that's going to be, that's pretty exciting. So who's going to play you? I don't know. Who do you think? <laughs> I don't know. That's a, it's always interesting to ask people that question because their vision of themselves is, qu is quite telling. <laughs> we'll leave that well, to see what happens. Well, you know what? The funny thing is, I have to say, um, you know, I've, I've had so many people suggest to me that it should be Margot Robbie. And um, I think because she's got an Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, you know, that's sort of like, she's already like, oh, phew, that's one thing we've got out of the way because nobody can do an Australian accent. It's one of those, you know, when you hear an American or someone else trying to do an Australian accent, we're sort of like, oh, no. But um, so, look, I, lo I love, I love Margot. And I think she's um, very gutsy. I think whoever gets to play this role is going to... Um, you know, from an actor's point of view, would be thrilled because they it's, there's a lot of depth in in the role, and um, and there's going to be a lot of my life that people don't know about that will unfold in this. So um, I'm excited about it, and um, still a long way. Hollywood, American films take a long. You know, I mean, 
it's a long journey, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. So that's, that's wonderful. So, so that's good to hear what's happening for you where you are. Tell us about quarantine in Wyoming. COVID well, yeah, it's funny because um, my challenge here is actually to find people. <laughs> I, I live in a cabin surrounded by bears and moose. So um, I, I, I don't see people and I'm very used to it. I, I'm very, um, I'm a very social person, but living here has been um, a great challenge for me, learning to focus and be alone and be okay with stillness and silence and solitude. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I've had a lot of training in um, being, you know, very um, present with, and in my own company and yeah every day I'm, I'm writing I'm writing for the School for Resilience I'm actually studying um, I'm studying online at Stanford um, I'm studying uh, um, women's um, international health and human rights and I'm, I'm loving that and that's um, something that um, that I've you know want to spend um, a lot of time in the future doing advocacy work for women's rights. Um, so, no, I'm, I'm keeping really uh, busy and, um, yeah, very, very at peace. It has really impacted you a great deal in terms of supermarkets and, and, you know, staying away from hospitals and all of those things. Well, I, um, as I said, I live in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and I think in the last, so I, I just, I got back here five weeks ago. Before that, I was actually in Australia and in, I went to Istanbul. I was speaking at a um, UN women's conference over there for International Women's Day. So I got back just in time and before they closed the doors. So I've been back here for five, oh, maybe five or six weeks. And I think I've driven out of, out of my cabin twice in that time. Um, to the supermarket and that's it so uh, you know I understand uh, you know what other people are going through it's a, it's a very challenging and difficult time for, for most people um, you know I have my three children back in Australia my mother I just heard just an hour ago she's just been taken to hospital um, she's not well so you know that's worrying for me yeah, I, I don't know anyone. I mean, we're all doing life. Other things are happening for us. And we've got COVID on top of us. And the collective trauma for those still going through a really deep experiences, particularly women impacted by domestic and family violence. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, th there will be long-term support that is required once we're out of this. And you're quite right. As an Australian, we are all crossing our fingers. We mm. seem to be managing the situation as one of the better countries in the world so we're doing as we're told and we're staying home <laughs> you know, Australians are very good at doing what they're told Americans are not and I think um, it's very telling in the results right now so uh, you know we David my husband and I have a bit of a joke about it because he calls Australia a nanny state and, um, and and I said well yeah but actually right now I'm really glad that we are because um, you know we're very good at taking responsibility so, you know, there's a, you know, a section of Americans right now who are not doing the right thing and are not thinking, you know, in, in a compassionate and kind way towards others in the world. So it is um, challenging. And, and I think from my experience of, you know, lying in a spinal ward for six, six months, not being able to move, um, you know, I, I feel like my whole life I've sort of trained towards you know, experiences like this where I'm just able to let go of expectations and be very present with whatever we're experiencing. Hmm. You sound as though, and you've certainly alluded to it throughout this conversation, you're actually quite a spiritual person. Um, what does spirituality mean to you? Well, firstly, we're all spiritual. <laughs> um, that's what we are, you know, at our essence. Um, so, you know, I think it's the same, you know, we're spiritual beings having a human experience, not the other way around. I think when you've had an experience like I've had in my accident, leaving my body, um, you know, I did, I did cross over. I, I did, I do have a very clear memory and awareness of what happened, which I don't normally talk about. Um, so you, you can't have an experience like that and not be changed. But to me personally, um, 
spirituality is just knowing that there's there's something bigger that this is not it it's knowing that um as the original title of my ted talk you know we're not our bodies we're much more than that and it's being connected to everyone and everything around us whether i mean david and i have a practice every morning where we get up together and we give grace and we talk about what we're grateful for um you know and for david it's very much you know his spiritual practice is he's a mountain man you know it's being out in nature it's just being out alone in the middle of nowhere um you know there's a sort of a, a reverence in that i think there's a reverence in everything that we're experiencing life and i and i believe that um you know what we're going through right now and i always say wherever we are is where we we're supposed to be and and that's that's a hard thing to say because um, people say well how do you know actually because it's where we are <laughs> it's where we are so you know this is a very painful time for very many you know a lot of people and as you alluded to you know particularly women experiencing um domestic violence it's a painful experience for many people that are out of work worrying about paying their rent but i think this is going to make us all think deeply about how we want to how we want to be in the future how do we want to live our lives in the future what's important to us and i'm really hoping that we come out of this as a, a much more compassionate and kind world and that's common with everybody I've spoken to. The other commonality is everyone, when they're talking about their own sector, if you like, that they operate in, they're all saying, but the system's broken. And I keep saying, which one? <laughs> because we're talking about yeah. intersecting systems and coming out the other side. You're quite right. It is about self-compassion. It's also about being kinder and, 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 and more humane to each other because we've got to a stage where money drove the world and money is an artificial construct. You know, man created money. Yeah. It's yes. not wrapped up in our own self-care or our own spirituality and as you've said you've drawn upon your spirituality a number of times throughout your life of being connected during really difficult times yeah and i think you know that i i think that you know i'm not a i'm not a socialist i'm not a capitalist i'm somewhere in the middle maybe i think that you need people i mean you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with money. Money is just energy. And you, you know, there's some great compassionate acts that are happening now. I mean, the Melinda, the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation donating, you know, billions of dollars. Um, you know, so money in itself isn't a bad thing, but the love of money, of course, as we know, is dangerous. Um, putting that above human lives and humanity. Um, you know, I certainly think that there's a, a new type of you know neo-capitalism perhaps where you know we are more democratic more socialist in that we look after people the vulnerable the sick um you know there's um those that are actually at risk like women who are living in, in um, violent situations right now and this is a chance for and there's some incredibly compassionate acts coming forward and i think i would um, my advice is for people you only need a certain amount of news we know what's going on you know yeah. so really limit the amount of news that we take in every day um, and be safe and be kind yeah well that leads to my last question about news consumption looking after yourself self-care is a focus of these conversations and i ask everybody what does self-care to mean to you? How do you practice it? And what advice would you give to everyone? And I probably would like you to talk to your resilience school because it's more than appropriate in self-care. Well, it is. And I think, you know, um, so in the School for Resilience, which we're just about to launch and I'm very excited about, we have um, five foundations. It's a way of, um, so, you know, these five, I'll just, you know, to give you an idea, with flying as a pilot, we set an attitude, which is a way of, um, it's, how we, it's how we navigate, it's how we keep an aeroplane in the air. So in the same way, these foundations are the way that we, um, the way that we intentionally set, um, you know, a, an attitude, the way we see life. And the five of those are, you're never alone. Um, the universe always says yes. 
Uh, you're the producer, director, and actor in the story of your life. Choice is the most powerful tool you have. And um, very relevant right now, this too shall pass. So we sort of say that these are the, you know, sort of the, the foundations and the pillars of how we view our life. And then, you know, we have 12 key steps and they're based on um, empirical evidence, spiritual truths, and also my, my experience for adversity and loss. So to your question about self-care, you know, the key step number three is compassion. And compassion, of course, you know, we always think of compassion towards other people. And, um, and we're not very good at giving compassion to ourselves. Yeah. You know, we often are really kind to our friends and we say, no, you don't speak to yourself like that. You're actually, you're, you're incredible. You're very, and we compliment our friends and then we go home and go, oh, I'm an idiot. Oh, what did I do? You know? So, you know, they call that idiot compassion actually, um, where I think it's originally goes back to a Buddhist teaching where they say that if you offer compassion to others and not yourself, it's called idiot compassion. So for me, self-compassion is a very important aspect of life. And in the course, we uh, teach that. And we also refer to the work of Dr. Kristen Neff, who's a leader in the uh, self-compassion um, work and research. And one of those, of course, is just having, you know, being able to identify what are your self-care routines. You know, whether it's um, taking a break, whether it's meditation, whether it's yoga or exercise, for me personally, I, my self-care routine is being able to take a lovely warm bath. <laughs> you know, that's when I switch off. And for me, as a as a, a paraplegic, you know, my at the end of the day, my legs are tired, my body is aching. Um, I do experience chronic pain, so I've had to um, deal with that. I, I I take myself through a body scan routine. I'll have a, a bath. Um, I have a self-compassion exercise. Um, you know, I know how to, I know how to release oxytocin in the body, the parasympathetic nervous system. You know, placing a hand on a heart or a self hug. Uh, it's very hard to hug another person right now unless you have someone right there with you. So we need to know how to do that, how to do that for ourselves, how to release oxytocin, um, and all of those things are a part of resilience. Uh, if people want to know what that is, resilience is actually being able to in a self-directed way, change your brain, uh, rewire your brain. And in doing that, we create a new narrative, a new story of our life. Um, for example, I decided very early on that, um, you know, I had to learn about forgiveness, the man that ran me over. Mm. But the story I created was, I'm not a victim. Um, I can change my life. I can rewrite the story. This is happening for me, not to me. I'm not a I'm not a woman with a disability. I'm a woman with opportunities. So all of those, you know, they're all part of the self care, you know, package as well. Being able to have those tools in your toolkit, so you can pull them out when you need them, particularly now. Mm. So, so is the resilience school? Is it operating yet, or where do people go to pre-register? Yeah, they can go to. Well, they can follow me on you know, LinkedIn, Instagram. Instagram, I'm Janine underscore Shepherd. LinkedIn, obviously Janine Shepherd. Twitter, uh, at Janine Shepherd, and my Facebook page. But probably best if they want to go to my website, JanineShepherd.com. And that's Shepherd S H E P H E R D. They can do a really fun um, resilience quiz which is based around the 12 key steps. And if they go to the learn tab at the top, there's some free tools in there as well. But if they go to the learn tab, scroll down, they can go to the school for resilience. And there's all the information on the course there as well. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Janine. Let's talk again when the school for resilience is, is operating and maybe yep. share other tips. Oh, it is. People can listeners. go on now. Yeah, people can go and um, put their name down, subscribe to my email list. I mean, I had an email that just went out yesterday, I think. Um, and there's a lot of tools that go out in my emails. So um, they can go on and actually put in an expression of interest and we will keep them in touch with when um, we're launching. We would have launched by now, but of course we haven't been able to record because no one can travel. So <laughs> same problem for everybody. Yeah, it <laughs> is. is but... we're doing this in this manner. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Janine. Thanks so much, Kathy. Bye. Kathy. Bye.